Welcome to this Whole Life Action Hour. I am Ocean Robbins. I'll be your host today, and I am so happy that we are here right now to focus on an area of critical importance to just about everybody, which is mental health. You know, your brain shapes how you feel, how you think, how you respond to everything that happens to you, even who you experience to be you. When your brain is in balance, you are resourceful, you are creative, you are capable, and that is how you were designed to be. But more and more people today are suffering from mood and anxiety disorders, from ADHD, from addictions, from PTSD, uh, various kinds of psychosis and personality disorders, and from feelings of brain fog and apathy and chronic frustration. And if you're feeling any of those things, I want you to know you are not alone and there is hope. Recent neuroscience breakthroughs are shedding light on why all this is happening to so many people today, and more importantly, what we can do about it. So in this session, we're gonna be talking with one of the world's top psychiatrists and neuroscience experts in looking at how you can improve your mood and sharpen your mind and even help to prevent dementia with diet and lifestyle choices. And I wanna be very clear, nothing we are sharing today is medical advice. This is coaching, this is sharing our own best insights, but as in all things, Use your own best judgment and talk with a qualified healthcare professional about your specific health needs and realities. We are here today with Dr. Daniel Amen. He is an adult and child psychiatrist, a 12 time New York Times bestselling author, and the founder of Amen Clinics, which has nine clinics across the United States. It's the world's largest, they've, they've conducted the world's largest database of brain scans related to behavior, totaling more than 160 thousand scans on patients from 150 countries. Dr. Amen's research team has published more than 70 scientific articles on his work. Discover Magazine named his research as one of the top stories in science. He's also hosted 15 popular television shows about the brain. He is widely regarded as a gifted teacher. His most recent book is The End of Mental Illness. And he's also spoken in many of our Food Revolution summits. Dr. Amen, thanks for being here. Hi, Ocean. Pleasure to see you and be with you today. Wonderful. Well, let's jump right in to this mental illness. I suppose we could call it a pandemic or an epidemic. So many people are hurting right now with one thing or another. And uh, a lot of people are, of course, getting medicated. A lot aren't getting medicated, but they're still suffering. If there was one fundamental thing that was driving a lot of the suffering in the mental health space today, what would you say it is? It's uncertainty. And people have really lost their sense of certainty. They don't know what's going to happen day to day. Um, they're living in fear. And we live in a society where people have undisciplined minds. And I remember when the pandemic happened for me, um, I, my new book, The End of Mental Illness, came out March 3rd. I was on a book tour and went to Tampa Bay, where the day I got there, the first COVID cases were reported. And then I went to Atlanta, and the first day I got there, the first COVID cases were <laughs> reported in Atlanta. Um, and then I came home, and I was supposed to go to New York. The Mel Robbins show was going to do a whole show on my new book and my work. Mel Robbins had been to our Manhattan clinic and got scanned. And I was really excited about it, but starting to get pretty nervous about getting on an airplane with COVID-19. And when I'm in my bathroom getting ready to go to the airport, I got a call from the producer who said, don't come. We are closing the studio and I think they're going to close Manhattan. And I'm like, whoa. And that yeah. night I wrote down mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hands. We need to disinfect our thoughts. I call it kill the ants, the automatic negative thoughts that steal our happiness. So mental hygiene is just as important as washing your hand. And then I wrote down this term called pandemic squared, that this current pandemic, because of the uncertainty, the social isolation, the fear, ultimately the societal disruption, the political divide, 
um, spawned another pandemic, which is anxiety, depression, trauma, and grief. Depression was about 8% of the population. In February, by August, it was 28%. Oh I've never goodness. seen anything like that happen in my lifetime. That yeah. depression literally more than tripled. And the big winner in the pandemic is the pharmaceutical industry because it's just so easy now on Zoom to Zoom with your doctor and say, I'm anxious, I'm depressed, I can't sleep and end up on an antidepressant, an anti-anxiety medicine, a sleep medication. And people have never done sort of the right mental hygiene things First, I'm not opposed to medicine. If you're taking it, please don't stop it. As Ocean said, talk to your healthcare provider. Um, but there's so many things to do first in the end of mental illness. I have this chapter on mind medicine versus nutraceuticals. And it's like, if you're depressed, here are 10 things to do before you take an antidepressant. If you're anxious, here are 10 things to do. Before you take an anti-anxiety medicine. Now, if they don't work, take the medicine. Um, but, you know, most people don't know. There are just so many other ways to feel right. Are the 10 things that you should do before taking an anti-anxiety medication, for example, pretty similar to the 10 things you should do if you're dealing with depression or if you're having trouble with sleep or a lot of these other issues? Is it generally kind of the same list or is there a lot of variation depending on the condition? No, there's variation based on your particular issues. I mean, of course, everyone should exercise. Exercise is a universal brain health, mental health treatment. And it's not just any exercise, it's coordination exercises. So dance or tennis or table tennis um, are really great for you because it activates a part of the brain called the cerebellum that has half of the brain's neurons. And so coordination exercises, I played so much table tennis during this pandemic, um, is really great for you. Of course, everybody should eat right. That sugar is pro-inflammatory. It not only makes you fat, but it makes you unhappy. Uh, so happy in the short run, unhappy in the long run. Um, being overweight, I published a study this year on 35 thousand scans in the journal of alzheimer's disease that as your weight goes up the function of your brain every area of the brain goes down which of course should scare the fat off anyone um all of us should learn how to kill the ants the automatic negative thoughts but depression depending on the type usually we want to stimulate the brain um because the our big research studies have shown depression usually goes with low blood flow to the brain where anxiety tends to go with high blood flow um in the limbic or emotional centers of the brain and so for anxiety we want to calm things down gaba magnesium theanine um, can just be so helpful. Um, depression, it's more EPA, fish oil, uh, or omega-3 fatty acids, and a supplement like SAMe. I'm also a huge fan of saffron. And, uh, you know, sleep's sort of a different animal as well. All of these things, like with sleep or brain health, you want to love your brain, love your sleep, avoid things that hurt your brain, avoid things that hurt your sleep, and then do things that help. Um, so, um, so a bit different. Yeah, but a lot in common. Uh, Daniel, how do we kill the ants? Well, it's just such an important human skill. I believe they should actually teach it to second graders. I wrote a book uh, that's done really well called Captain Snout and the Superpower Questions, where I'm teaching seven-year-olds how to kill the ants. And the exercise is really simple. When you feel sad or when you feel mad or when you feel nervous or out of control, write down what you're thinking. And then ask yourself, is it true? 
Um, I have an exercise. I have a book coming out in March uh, called Your Brain is Always Listening. And it's about the dragons from the past that breathe fire on our emotional brains and the ants that infest our minds. And there's an exercise in there. Give me a hundred of your worst thoughts. And if you do this exercise, I'll change your life. And the exercise is basically write them down and then use the front part of your brain, your prefrontal cortex to assess them. Is it true? Can I absolutely know that it's true? And it's just so powerful, so helpful. You don't have to believe every stupid thing you think. And please don't share everything you think with the people in your life. It's not appropriate. Seinfeld once said, the brain is a sneaky organ. We all have weird, crazy, stupid, sexual, violent thoughts that nobody should ever hear. And uh, learning how to assess them and inhibit them is just critically important. Also, I I teach my patients uh, to give their mind a name just to separate you a little bit from your mind. And it works so well. Um, my mind, I named it after my pet raccoon when I was 16. And she used to talk all the time. <laughs> like, all of, like, what are you saying? I had no idea. And, you know, it's often that's the sort of noise that your brain puts out. And so I named my mind Hermie. And so if I find I'm being hard on myself, I'm like, you know, Hermie, I'm going to put you in your cage if you don't behave. Just that <laughs> separation can be so helpful. Yeah. It's so interesting because the mind thinks in words like I, and so we think it's us. But, you know, anybody who's done meditation has probably noticed a witness place from which the thoughts are over here and our actual core sense of self isn't identified with them. Sounds like that's part of what you're describing here to create some space so that the you thoughts are, are not, not identified not. with in the same way. Right. Yeah. I remember when not. I uh, when I first met my wife, I was 20. She was 18. It was a while back. And um we, I, I had this sort of altruistic notion that we would share everything with each other. <laughs> and and uh, it was around the time that we had premature twins. And, uh, you know, some of the thoughts that went through my head at three o'clock in the morning when we were on, you know, only sleeping an hour a night as they were screaming all the time um, were not appropriate to share. <laughs> it was, and that's when I really realized, oh, my mind can think things that are totally not me. They're a product of my distress and my agitation or my fear or my upset. And it is actually more true, it's more honest to not give voice to those verbally. And it's yet, so important. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, no, that's just such an important skill to know what you want in your relationship with your wife. You know, divorce is just skyrocketed during this time. And you know, so for example, with Tana, who I think you've met, my wife, I always want the same thing. I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive, passionate relationship with her. Always want that. Always. Don't always feel like that. I get these rude thoughts in my head and I generally inhibit them unless it fits, right? So I have my patients always ask themselves a couple of really simple questions, like, is it true with the thoughts you have? And does it fit? Does my behavior fit with what I want? And if I want a kind, caring, loving, supportive relationship, saying that hateful thing that just popped up in my head to her doesn't fit. And it actually damages what I want. So being able to inhibit is a critical human skill. And when people have sleepy frontal lobes, they often have no filter, which means they have more stress 
in their relationships. And they also have more stressful thoughts because the front part of your brain inhibits negativity. And if it's sleepy, you know, maybe you used to hit soccer balls with your head or you're in a car accident or you eat bad food that creates inflammation in a smaller brain, um, you're just not as happy in large part because your decisions are not as effective. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so when you notice that you're thinking thoughts that aren't absolutely true and that aren't productive towards what you want, I'll say I often notice that those thoughts tend to repeat. And I, I think it's there's been studies on this, that the vast majority of the thoughts that go through our head are recycled. You know, recycling is wonderful when it comes to saving the planet, but it's really bad when it comes to creative thought <laughs> and, you know, uh, and expression. And most of our thoughts are recycled. There's groups, there's re repetitive patterns that they just cycle through. And so the good news is that if you can address one repetitive thought in a constructive way, you can adjust thousands and thousands and thousands of moments, perhaps even months of your life that you might have spent thinking that same thought cyclically otherwise. Um, I'm curious when you become aware that there's a repetitive thought going on that is not fundamentally true or it's not rooted in your core values, what do you do then? Back to killing the ants. I mean, you get that it's not accurate. What, what do you do with that still? Well, you write it down. So I learned this from my friend, Byron Katie. It's really yeah. five questions. It's, so if we pick a thought, do you have a thought you wanna share that just goes over and over that doesn't serve you? Oh, me? Uh, sure. Uh, I could say um, uh, my needs aren't important <laughs> to my wife. <laughs> say that yeah. again. Uh, I, could say, I, I might think, oh, my wife's not care doesn't care what I think or feel. Okay. That's a great thought. Yeah. It's yeah. toxic. No, a terrible one, but I get your point. <laughs> the toxic thought. Um, <laughs> so question number one, is it true? No, not at all. Question two, is it absolutely true with 100% certainty? And no. if the answer one is no, two is automatically no. Third, how do you feel when you believe the thought? Yeah, I feel agitated. I feel frustrated. I feel defensive. Um, and Diminished, uh, small. Yeah, diminished, yeah. So it's the lies we tell ourselves that drives the bad feelings. Thoughts drive feelings. Feelings drive behaviors. And behaviors drive what we have or what we don't have. And yeah. so the fourth question is, how would you feel if you didn't have the thought? If you couldn't have the thought? Uh Connected, loved, um, creative. And five, five is my favorite question of all of them. Take the original thought that troubles you and flip it to the opposite. And then you ask yourself if the opposite might not be true or even truer than the original Thought. So my wife doesn't care what I think turns into my wife cares what I think. And then you go, do I have any evidence of that? So do you have any evidence that she cares about what you think? Yeah, it's a great deal. And then you write that down because when you write it down, you get it out of your head. And, you know, Byron Katie's, she calls her work the work because it is work and you have to train your mind and like if you're going to be healthy, you have to eat right over and over and over and again, right? You have to make it a habit. Managing your mind, you have to do over and over and over again. Physical fitness doesn't happen once. Mental fitness never happens just one time. You get this epiphany. You know, I've been teaching how to kill the ants for 25 years. And I do it as a regular practice because that way 
despite what's going on around me, I can be happy. And happiness requires mental discipline. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Beautiful. I, I love Byron Katie's work too. And uh, it sounded familiar when you started talking about it. Um, su such such wonderful practice. So simple and so life-changing. Um, so we've like, got a lot of I mean, questions from, from our Whole Life Club members. So I'd love to get to some of those if we can. They'll, they'll kind of take us around in our conversation here. Um, Celeste said, I have mild ringing in my ears. I read that might be a problem in my brain. Might a brain scan help determine the problem? What happens to the brain to cause ringing in the ears? And we actually had a couple of other people who also described this. One said, they think of it as a white no low noise, uh, but sometimes they wish they could hear the silence. Another person said they hear a high pitched sound in their ears. Do you know if there's a way to find relief? So sometimes the crystals in your inner ear get loose and it can make you dizzy or create um, these weird noises. Uh, they, they don't have a treatment besides rest and going toward the dizziness as opposed to not moving. Uh, that'll make a difference. So the first stop for that is always an ENT to get a really good audiological evaluation. Um, there's a treatment we do as psychiatrists called TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's actually been found to be helpful for tinnitus where you get these abnormal noises that just haunt you, bother you. And it's been found to be helpful as well. Thank you. Um, Becca asked, how does one truly know if they are bipolar or have ADHD? Are there any types of tests that actually confirm this? So we do imaging at Amen Clinics. It really helps us distinguish. Um, if you, but, but you know, the simple answer is look at someone's life. Um, I was just on Dr. Phil today. Uh, we did a show about an 18 year old girl who was diagnosed with ADD when she was six, learning disabilities, and then later borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. And if you really understand her, she's had severe ADD untreated her whole life. And, um, but she's angry and irritable. Um, and so they slapped her on four different medications and I'm um, just like, but they didn't give her the right one. Um, when you have ADD, you have it your whole life. Um, short attention span, distractibility, disorganization, procrastination, restlessness, impulse control issues. And that's sort of the story of your life. People with bipolar disorder, well, they often don't have their first manic episode or their first depressive episode until they're in their late teens. And it's clearly, they, they cycle, they have different time periods. Sometimes they're fine. Sometimes they're depressed. Sometimes they're manic. As opposed to someone who's ADD, they're sort of like that all the time. You know, they can have mood swings 17 in a day, as opposed to someone who's really bipolar. They get these discrete episodes where they don't need to sleep. Their thoughts go fast. They become hypersexual, hyper-religious, spend money they don't have, maybe even become psychotic. And then they sort of go back to normal or they get depressed. That's why it's called bipolar, go between two poles. And I think of bipolar as the fad diagnosis of 2020. So many people get that diagnosis and they've never had a manic episode. Sometimes um, it can masquerade that a traumatic brain injury can masquerade as bipolar disorder. But quite frankly, if you actually never look at the brain, how would you know? And psychiatry this is sort of the whole point of my book, The End of Mental Illness. These aren't mental illnesses. Call someone mental, that shames them. Call someone a brain and you elevate them. And I argue we need to get rid of the term mental illness, call these things what they really are, brain health issues that steal your mind. And that one idea just changes everything. Because people see their problems as medical and not moral, decreases shame and guilt, increases compassion from their families. 
Mm, I'm having chills as you say that. I just want to underline that again. People seeing their problems as medical, not moral, decreases shame and guilt and increases compassion. That's so profound. There is this kind of stigma placed on the, the term mental illness. So shifting that, you said um, it's looking, at, uh, looking at it as a brain health issue. Is that right? Yeah. Thank yeah. You. And you have the food revolution. My big goal in life is to create a brain health revolution um, because that's how we're going to end mental illness. Um, you know, I learned early on, I told my dad in 1979 that I wanted to be a psychiatrist. And he asked me why I didn't want to be a real doctor, why I wanted to be a nut doctor and hang out with nuts all day long. Now, my father would have never gotten Father of the Year Award, but he just reflected what most people think in society, that if you have to see a psychiatrist, that, well, that means you're mental, that means you're crazy. And it's so unfair. It's so stigmatizing. When you look at the brain, is that's what we do at Amen Clinics, it's like, I can make this brain better. And how exciting is that, right? Doesn't everybody want a better brain? Because with a better brain comes a better life. Your work uh, when you started it was on the fringes in some ways, which is what your dad was kind of reflecting there. But it's it's become more widely recognized that, that a lot of the things you're advocating for are, are fundamental to understanding brain health. Um, What's it been like for you to see your work gain more traction in the mainstream? You know, the most important thing to me is watching people get well. That that's where the little dopamine hit in my brain comes from. When our yeah. work changes someone's life, what people think of me, I mean, it's just so fleeting. Um, but it's the stories of transformation. Um, initially, it was really hard. Um, I am a flawed person. I like it when people like me. I don't like conflict. And early on, a lot of people didn't like me, called me bad names. And I was in the middle of a fight. But, but I learned something really important. 1995, my nine-year-old nephew attacked a little girl on the baseball field. And based on my work, I scanned him and found he had a cyst the size of a golf ball occupying the space of his temporal lobe. And when we got it taken out, his behavior completely went back to normal. And as a child I love, who's my godson. And it was really that moment I just stopped caring what you thought about me. And I was ready to take on the fight. And, and I feel so blessed um, to have been able to do the work uh, I do. And if you don't like me because I wanna scan your brain before I drug you, then you know I sort of just don't think you're very smart. Yes, thank you. Uh, lots more questions here. Uh, Leah said, Dr. Eamon, I have a relative with schizophrenia. Can diet reverse that or help that like it can other chronic conditions? Schizophrenia is a brain disorder and it's not one thing. It's all sorts of different things. We've scanned thousands of schizophrenic brains. Some of them are damaged. Some of them are infected. Lyme if you take a map of the United States and you look at the highest incidence of schizophrenia, it's the Northeast, the North Midwest and the West Coast. And then if you overlay the highest incidence of Lyme disease, they're actually identical. So I think anybody with schizophrenia in those areas, they should be screened for Lyme. Um, toxoplasmosis, which is a parasite you get from feral cats um, can also cause psychotic symptoms. So I think in 30 years, there's going to be a whole subspecialty of psychiatry on infectious disease psychiatry. Um, but there's actually some fascinating early studies that when you take gluten and dairy out of a schizophrenic diet, they improve. 
that they actually need less medicine. They have fewer relapses. Uh, I think when you get on the right diet, it improves all brain health conditions. Um, your brain is 2% of your body's weight, but it uses 20 to 30% of the calories you consume. If you are on a fast food diet, you're more likely to have a fast food mind. Thank you. Um, we heard from Jennifer who said, what are your top three recommendations for how to prevent or minimize risk of dementia? And how can we use these to address young people who are addicted to smartphones and other devices? Kind of two different questions there, but uh, what's your thought for Jennifer? Um, if you want to keep your brain healthy or rescue it, if it's headed for the dark place, you have to prevent or treat the 11 major risk factors that steal your mind. So I didn't think I wouldn't give you three. I would give you 11 and just super simple. Uh, I have a mnemonic called bright mind. So B is for blood flow. Low blood flow is the number one brain imaging predictor of Alzheimer's disease, exercise. And if you have hypertension, treat it. Foods that increase blood flow, beets, spicy foods, cayenne, pepper, um, oregano have all been shown. R is retirement and aging, which means you should make new learning part of your life every day. I is inflammation. Um, so I'm a huge fan of omega-3 fatty acids. G is genetics. Know your risk factors and attack them as soon as possible. H is head trauma. Don't let your children play tackle football or hit soccer balls with their head. Uh, T is toxins. Alcohol is not a health food. I don't know how else to say that. Marijuana is not going green. Both of those things are toxic to brain function. Um, it's know your risks and sort of the a third, actually maybe a little more, 40% of the end of mental illness is going after each of those risk factors. And basically it comes down to love your brain, avoid things that hurt it, know the list, do things that help it, know the list. And then smartphones, um, delay um, gadgets for as much as you can with your children. Um, they should not be having their own phones at six, seven, eight, probably not till 12 or 13, and then put parental controls on them. Don't be lazy about that. It's just absolutely critical because um, there's a great um, new documentary on Netflix called The Social Dilemma. And yeah. social media companies, Google, Microsoft, um, Facebook, they're going after mind share. So like Kellogg's went after stomach share by putting sugary cereals on the bottom two shelves so kids could beg for them and make you feel guilty when you didn't buy them for them. Um, they're going after social media companies are going after mind share. They're stealing the minds of your children to make advertising dollars. You should be pretty upset about that. Watch Social Dilemma, it's really done well. Yeah, thank you for that. And for those who don't know, when it comes to parental controls, you can also set time of day controls and you can set uh, hours or minutes per day controls. Um, our, our son River, when he was first allowed to have access to a computer, we had more than our share of conflicts sometimes dragging him away, screaming from the computer when uh, his time was up. And then I discovered that with just a few clicks of a button, he would just get a five minute warning and a one minute warning, and then it would just shut down <laughs> at the right time. And he would come to me as happy as could be. All right, he was done with his computer time and he was ready to engage in the next activity. And the fighting was over in an instant. And uh, I took a couple minutes to set it up. So very worthwhile if you're a parent or a grandparent and you're having these kinds of struggles. Um, Daniel, Jerry asked, are there any studies about the long-term effects of antidepressants, specifically a plinzin? Is there any documented linkage to dementia? And are there cases where you recommend patients take antidepressants for life? So as far as I know, there's no bad long-term side effects. If it's the right medicine for you, you know, antidepressants can have side effects. Anti-anxiety drugs like Xanax are actually 
associated with a higher incidence of dementia. So I generally don't prescribe benzos like Xanax or Ativan, Valium. Um, my rule is if you have depression and we've done the 10 things to do before the antidepressant is I'll generally keep you on it for a year after you feel well, and then I'll slowly taper it. And if it happens again, well, now we're going to stay on it for somewhere between three to five years. If it happens a third time, I'll probably recommend you just take it because a third episode of major depression predicts you have a 70% chance of having a fourth episode. And so if it runs in your family, now it's really important to try and understand, well, why is the brain depressed? Is it infected? Has it been exposed to toxins? Is there a head injury? I did another show with Dr. Phil about a month ago where this kid had failed six medicines, six residential treatment programs. But you know, no one really got the history. When he was three years old, he was dropped 10 feet onto his head onto a concrete floor in the basement. And you could just see on his scan, he had a traumatic brain injury that no one had ever rehabilitated. Well, we put him in a hyperbaric chamber, gave him supplements and changed his diet to really rehabilitate his brain. And he's going to be much better and he won't need medicine for the rest of his life. But, you know, again, how would we know unless we actually looked at his brain? Thank you for that. Um, what about epilepsy? One in 10 people has an epileptic seizure in their lifetime. About one in 20 actually have multiple ones. Um, I, I, there's some folks saying that we may have, a lot of people are subclinically epileptic and they don't have ex recognized seizures, but they're having abnormal electrical activity. Is this something you think is widespread, maybe more widespread than we realize? And um, what can we do about it? So the M in Bright Mind stands for mind storms, which is abnormal electrical activity. I think it's way more common than people think. And the first thing is actually a ketogenic diet because ketogenic diets have been shown to decrease seizure frequency by 50%. I have a granddaughter who has a wicked seizure disorder, started when she was five months old with one day she had 160 seizures. I mean, it's just horrifying. And uh, on a ketogenic diet, uh, she basically didn't have a seizure for five years. And so food really matters and especially sugar, artificial dyes and sweeteners and preservatives can trigger abnormal electrical activity. So first thing I'd do is get your diet right. In fact, uh, our nutritionist has more testimonials than almost anybody else in our whole organization. Get your food right, your mind will follow. A word about that specifically. Um, we don't tend to speak too fondly of the ketogenic diet in our work because of its heavy reliance on animal products, typically, as typically practiced. And the fact that uh, the data on it for a lot of health conditions is, is that it's used for is not too great, in including weight loss. There are other ways to get there. But there is no question that when it comes to epilepsy, there is some data to back that up you know, quite a bit of it. So yeah, I just wanted to- a hundred randomized trials showing its efficacy. So I don't yeah. think it's that healthy of a diet um, because there's not a lot of plants and right. plants are where medicine is. It's big, big nature's pharmacy is in plants. Uh, but for that population, I think it's it's worth considering. Yeah, thank you. And of course, anybody who's going ketogenic has got to really look out for fiber because most people aren't getting enough fiber to begin with. And there's no fiber in any animal products and there's no fiber in bottled oils and ketogenic diets tend to be high in both of those. There are ways to be plant-based in ketogenic. But again, for most folks, the, the direction is uh, lots of fiber and lots of plants, lots of vegetables in particular is going to be optimal. And that gets me to our next question from Judy, who asked, what foods are best for happiness? What fruits are best for foods. happiness? Which foods are best for happiness? 
Um, there's actually a study from Australia that colorful fruits and vegetables up to eight servings a day has a linear correlation with happiness. So you're a lot, you're happier if you have two than if you have zero, happier if you have four than two and six than four and eight than six. I love that. Um, so, you know, I'm a huge fan of blueberries and they need to be organic. I think that's really important. But blueberries and pomegranate seeds and raspberries, um, I'm, I'm less a fan of um, pineapple um, and bananas because of the sugar content, but uh, low glycemic fruit and vegetables is just keep your blood sugar healthy and your skin will be prettier and you'll be happier. Thank you. Um, Barbara said somewhere I remember hearing that bipolar is a blood sugar imbalance. If someone works to keep their blood sugar balanced, does that help with bipolar issues? Um, yeah, I haven't heard that. But uh, when your blood sugar is not right, you are not right. Like my wife is somebody who really does well if she eats three or four or five times a day and can completely get hangry. Uh, so I always carry food with me when I'm with her. Um, this is great study where they took 107 couples and they measured their blood sugar right before bedtime. And then they gave them voodoo dolls and they asked them to express their feelings about their partner with the pins in the dolls. <laughs> and the people who had the lowest blood sugar had more than twice the number of pins in the dolls. And so... Wow taking making sure your blood sugar is healthy is critical for relationships and also relapse for alcoholics or drug addicts that relapse is much more likely to occur when you have low blood sugar states because low blood sugar states go with low blood flow to the brain which means more bad decisions yes thank you um pamela said Question for Dr. Amen. In her 23 years, our daughter has been diagnosed with ADHD, anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, and drug and alcohol addiction. All we know is that she's had a hard time of it, regardless of diet, which has gone from excellent as a child to horrible now. She's become very overweight and she abhors vegetables of any sort. Uh, I know she would do better on a healthy diet, but doubt she can be convinced to come up with the discipline required to allow her taste buds to change. Any suggestions? Well, when you have ADD, especially if it's not effectively treated, they're impulsive. And there's a higher incidence of obesity. I mean, there's a higher incidence of every bad thing because decision-making is spur of the moment and planning is generally not very good. So over time, you just want to nudge her to fall in love with her brain. It's one of the reasons I fell in love with our brain imaging work, because when people would see their scan, they would develop a personal relationship with their brain, and then they would be more likely to treat it better. And that just makes me really happy. And it makes my job easier because compliance goes up. Yes, thank you for that. Um, we focus a lot, of course, in our work on helping people fall in love with the foods that love us back, uh, because most of us are in um, really unhealthy relationships when it comes to the foods in our lives. And if you can, if you can learn to crave kale, you can binge as much as you want without significant consequence. Obviously, there are limits, but I don't know anybody who's actually encountered them. Um, and so, uh, but rewiring the brain to actually be drawn to the foods that are good for us uh, is critical. And it's its its its, its own art, isn't it? Um, you know, we, we created a course, Plant Powered and Thriving, specifically for that purpose, to help people implement. Because for so many people, the problem isn't knowing what to do, it's doing what they know. And um, so do you have any, do you have any tips, hacks for how to, 
how to how to shift the trajectory from an unhealthy diet to a healthy one. And particularly since these folks are asking about their daughter, how you can influence somebody you love in that way. So I think information is power, but it needs to go beyond that to motivation. And I worked with BJ Fogg at Stanford for six months, creating little tiny habits. What's the smallest thing I can do today that will make the biggest difference? And one of our questions is, do I love foods that love me back, right? Just as you said, I'm in a relationship, with foods and so knowing that but then making those healthy foods delicious um that's often the trick uh my wife tana has a cookbook called the brain warriors way all of the recipes are gluten-free dairy-free corn-free you know um sugar-free and they taste amazing so being willing to experiment. And so when she comes over uh, or if she's living with you, making things taste amazing and you can do it with spices and with herbs. You just have to sort of know how to do that. So people don't think they're suffering. I have a grandson that I love um, and he has Tourette's syndrome which is a tick disorder. Um, and my first thing is, and I do this with most of my patients, put them on an elimination diet. We're gonna eliminate gluten, corn, dairy, soy, artificial dyes, sweeteners, preservatives. And he came to visit me, which I just love. And I'm like, buddy, how are you doing? His first, with this super sad face, Grandpa, I don't like any of the foods. And I yeah. never yeah. let my patients or my loved ones lie to themselves. I'm like, you don't like any of them? Like not even one? No. I said, okay. He was with me four days. I said, our job is to find 20 foods you love that love you back. And he <laughs> went home with 45 foods he loved that loved him back. And now we're like well over a hundred and it's just not an issue anymore yeah. because he knows these help me and these make me have behaviors that cause my friends to make fun of me. And, you know, it's just sort of mindset and not letting them lie to themselves. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay, we, we see if we can get to a few more here before we have to wrap shortly. Uh, Lola said, can you explain in layman's terms how PTSD affects the brain and if the brain is ever able to fully recover from traumatic life events? So when Discover Magazine listed my research as one of the top 100 stories in science for 2015, I was between the discovery of a new dinosaur species and um, Elon Musk's uh, entry into the energy business. I published a study on 21,000 people showing we could separate emotional trauma, PTSD, from physical trauma, traumatic brain injury, with high levels of accuracy. When you've experienced emotional trauma, it activates your limbic or emotional circuits to work too hard. And we have all sorts of things that can calm them down. One of my favorite treatments is called EMDR, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing. There's another uh, process called havening that I like, uh, another one on tapping. There are ways to reset your brain. Um, supplements I like, like magnesium and GABA and theanine from green tea. Um, and when you look at the brain, I mean, you just see it all the time. It's like, oh, we need to reset this part of the brain. And, you know, way more often than not, it's possible. Yeah, thank you. 
Um, we had a question from Rosie who said, are there any studies relating diet to Asperger's or high functioning autism? The child in question is 15 now and is dysfunctional in social interactions, loves building with Legos, computer games and reading, wondering what if anything could help him. So often we see deficits in the cerebellum and the right temporal lobe where they don't read social cues properly. There's a treatment I like called the interactive metronome where it really targets increasing cerebellar function. Um, and then I, I've seen, it's why, why I'm interested in food and mental health is I had autistic children in the early nineties when autism was really starting to increase. And I put one of them on a gluten-free, dairy-free diet. And the next week he had 50 more words I'm like, whoa. And I've heard that story a lot. Um, there's another study out of the Netherlands, uh, kids who have ADD, that when they put them on an elimination diet, 70% of the kids um, showed significant improvement in their ADD symptoms, as significant as medication. And, you know, if it was me, would I want better food or mind altering medicine? Well, uh, for certain, I would want to start with food. And then if I needed medicine, I'd absolutely take it. But you know, we have it just completely backwards in psychiatry where we start with drugs and then maybe at some point they find a naturopath and they get their diet working right. It's a little insane. Yeah, thank you. It is. Elise said, I want to know how to improve my sleep. I've already gotten a CPAP, practice good sleep hygiene, get daily exercise and sunshine. I fall asleep well, but don't stay asleep. In the last month, I got a light box that helps me sleep more soundly at night. Are there any other tricks I don't know about? Again, she's got a CPAP, she's getting daily exercise and sunshine, and she got a light box. Any other suggestions for Ali? I'm a huge fan of light boxes. Uh, we actually make one, make one at BrainMD that's got both blue and white light that you get in front of for about a half an hour in the morning. Um, and it sounds like she's doing a lot of the right things. You know, I think sleep envy, you want to really care about it, avoid anything that hurts it, caffeine, alcohol, marijuana, they really disrupt REM sleep and, and then do things that help it, a dark room, a quiet room. Um, I'm a big fan of hypnosis. Uh, when I was a medical student, I got interested in it. When I was an intern at the Walter Reed Army Medical Center, everybody wanted a sleeping pill, I'd hypnotize them first. And I just found learning to manage your mind by directing um, your thoughts into a trance can be so helpful. So when you wake up, just have a routine, a process, to put yourself back to sleep and hypnotic tapes. We have one on our website, Brain Fit Life, uh, that could be helpful. Great, thank you. Well, that about wraps our time today. So um, anything else you wanna share in kind of closing about mental wellness and brain health? Well, if people have been intrigued, uh, you know, I'd love for them to go to amenclinics.com, amen like the last word in a prayer, clinics.com and they can learn about our clinics. We have a brand new clinic in Dallas. I'm so excited uh, about Texas. Um, and the end of mental illness is out now. And I know it could be useful to so many people to just let's reframe the discussion. And then let me teach you how to really get your brain the healthiest it can be. So again, if you wish to, you can find Amen Clinics. Again, that's at Amen clinics.com amen and, yeah and um and you can also get the end of mental illness anywhere good bookstores books are sold and even where some bad books are sold you can get it it's an uh, incredible resource daniel you are changing the way we think about ourselves and our lives you're you're changing the way we feel you're you're changing the way that we approach mental health 
in ways that are profound. And I believe that generations from now, people will look back at your work and look at it as a, a pivotal game changer in our whole understanding of how the brain works and what is possible. I wanna thank you so much for your decades of leadership, for your 12 best-selling books, um, for, for your pioneering leadership in research and understanding and brain scans and, and ultimately in helping us to live in better, healthier ways that create the results we want. It's been a fascinating conversation and so grateful for what you do and for sharing your wisdom with us today. Thanks, Ocean. My pleasure. Be well, everyone. When it comes to cancer, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart disease, and other chronic illness, what really matters isn't how many books you read, how many webinars you attend, or how much you know. What really matters at the end of the day is what you eat and how you live. The science has given us what we need to know. Now it's time for action. It's time to implement and optimize your healthy lifestyle. It's time to get results. It's time to say goodbye to confusion and hello to clarity. It's time to say goodbye to bad habits and hello to good ones. It's time to fall in love with foods that love you back. It's time to join a community that will support you in achieving your goals. It's time for whole life club. Click the link to find out more and to join in now.